So the next talk is from the boss, no? the conference <laughs> chair. <laughs> Paul, let me introduce yourself. I know almost everybody knows you so well. Um, but there are some spe specific things at the end of the bio that are really nice to hear. Um, Paul Francis is currently the Cirrus Logic Distinguished Professor and the Director of Graduate Programs in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at North Carolina State University. He earned his PhD from the University of Adelaide in Australia. He has also worked at AT&T Bell Laboratories, DSTO Australia, Australia Telecom, Rambles, and four companies he co-founded, Communica, Lightspin Technologies, Polymer Braille Incorporated, and Indago Technologies. His current interests include applying machine learning to EDA, building AI accelerators, neuromorphic computing, RFID, advanced packaging, 2.5D and 3D ICs, and secure chip design. He has learned several major efforts. He, uh, sorry, he has led several major efforts and published over 300 papers in this area. In 1993, he received an NSF Young Investigators Award. In 2001, was selected to join the North Carolina State University Academy of Outstanding Teachers. In 2003, selected as a distinguished alumni professor received the Alcoa Research Award in 2005 and the Board of Governors Teaching Award in 2014. He served with the Australian Army Reserve for 13 years as an infantry soldier and officer. He is pilot in the Bandit Flight Team, a formation flying unit. He is a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, thank you, Peter. I, I didn't mean to recall that. <laughs> but thank you for the introduction. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a work done by Lee Baker, who is a PhD student, and Bob Patty collaborated with us on this. Uh, and that was looking at uh, uh, 3D DRAMs uh, in the context of uh, machine learning accelerators. Um, and what I'm going to do is uh, uh, briefly motivate this before presenting the solution. Actually, the motivation was very well presented by Mustafa. I could just have copied his slide and put it up here and, and you know, I'll be done with the next five slides. So I'll, I'll go through the motivation fairly quickly. Um, you know, you're, you're probably familiar with machine learning uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, I'm gonna look at convolutional neural networks, which is largely used for image recognition, uh, deep neural networks, which are used uh, for uh, non-image classification, for example, in Google Brain, and long short-term memory, which is uh, good at sequences and is very heavily used in, uh, in language, both translation and, uh, and recognition. So this particular work uh, uh, is the, the calculated results are based on uh, convolutional neural network um, and uh, image recognition. They have a large number of parameters uh, and we've assumed single point floating precision in this work uh, and uh, to have 10 cameras operating simultaneously and in real time and real time uh, does exasperate the requirements. Uh, so for example, the uh, 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 Tesla um, has nine cameras on it and there are vehicles with up to 28 cameras on it, on them. So uh, you need to be able to process a lot of uh, video, visual information in, uh, in real time uh, to uh, satisfy self-driving uh, capabilities. In fact, if you go to the extreme, which is assume a batch size of one, uh, that means you're not sharing the weights then uh, you need a lot of bandwidth, uh, uh, 26 terabits per second uh, of bandwidth to meet the requirements of 10 cameras in real time. And you have about 65 gigabits of, uh, of capacity that's required. Uh, and, and this is uh, 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 fairly consistent with what Mustafa presented. But it's not only convolutional neural networks that need uh, both large amounts of memory bandwidth and also large amounts of capacity. Uh, other neural networks uh, need uh, lots of capacity as well and bandwidth. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Google Rank uh, engines, uh, which are all indirect users of, uh, which are deep neural networks, uh, fully connected ones. And I'm going to talk about Translate, Google Translate, which is a, a long short-term memory neural network. What characterizes these is that you have a, a lot less computation per byte fetched from memory. 
So you can benefit. So to keep up with the computation, you need a lot more memory bandwidth. And I'll, I'll illustrate that in the next couple of slides. So if you compare a, a convolutional neural network uh, with Google Brain, you need eight times more memory bandwidth if you're going to keep up with the same computational throughput. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is work actually from uh, 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 presented at Google, uh, for, for provenance by Google. Similarly, in uh, Translate, it's even worse, uh, long short-term memory. If you're going to keep up with the uh, computation throughput, you need 27 times more memory bandwidth uh, than you do in a convolutional neural network. So I've illustrated that graphically on this slide here. Uh, uh, HBM2, capable of 256 gigabytes per second. Uh, in contrast, a saturated TPU, Google's uh, uh, a tensor processing unit running uh, an MLP, it has in Google Brain, needs uh, 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 3320 gigabytes per second. The saturated TPU running LSTM needs over 1,000 gigabytes per second. I'm also going to present some results uh, from another project uh, where we designed an LSTM accelerator uh, that needs a similar throughput in order to uh, meet the uh, full requirements. So I'm going to describe results based on two different memories, but mainly on the Tezzeron DIRAM4. Uh, this is why we collaborated with Bob. Uh, this, this is, this is uh, 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 Bob's concept for a very high performance uh, 3D DRAM that can be stacked with logic. Uh, so it's uh, a 64 gigabit uh, memory uh, with very fast latency and broken up into uh, 64 actual individual memories, which are all individually accessible uh, and uh, capable. Uh, capable is published of eight terabits per second, but there's a lot more bandwidth that could potentially be exposed in it particularly in a 3D fashion, and that's what we exploited in this collaboration. So, uh, well, so this is the organization that we're looking at. Uh, we have the uh, a DRAM, which is really organized as 64 individual stacked banks connected to a, an IO layer, uh, connected to a processing, uh, a, a communications layer, and connected to a processing element layer. Uh, and, and this is the architecture of the system that we uh, did a detailed design study on uh, to, to show the benefits of custom 3D DRAM. Sorry, I, uh, I should have animated all that before I started. Uh, so again, uh, it's really 64 banks uh, connecting uh, these uh, three logic layers together with the DRAM layers. Oops. So we did some customization on the DIRAM4, uh, mainly to expose more bandwidth. Uh, we redesigned the page interface so we can uh, transfer an entire page in a burst of two cycles, uh, uh, very aggressive. Um, <coughs> we, uh, 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 including accommodating the idle time after page close, and we used write masks uh, to avoid read, modify, write. And the, the nice thing about uh, this mem using a DRAM uh, for machine learning and is a machine learning inference more specifically, is, it, is it the work, the, the data you need is very predictable. You can predict it in advance and thus fetch it in advance and thus absorb the, uh, data, the uh, delay in DRAM. We call this a streaming architecture uh, where you, the uh, port manager and the PEs uh, predictively uh, fetch weights and data uh, from the uh, 3D DRAM. So combining these modifications, we have, a, we have a lot of bandwidth. This is the bandwidth per uh, DRAM block. Remember, there's 64 of these. Uh, the DRAM itself uh, can uh, transfer uh, 2,048 gigabits per second up or down. We don't need all that bandwidth down up, so we, we mainly expose the bandwidth down. Again, 2,048 gigabits per second, gigabytes per second, uh, and uh, restricted the bandwidth up to reduce the amount of I.O. that's needed. And the uh, network manager units can also communi communicate horizontally using a network on chip uh, with the neighboring uh, banks uh, of, of DRAM, because they particularly the data portion of the traffic has to be able to transfer horizontally, whereas the weight traffic can be transferred vertically. So again, the key here is to absorb the DRAM latency uh, by predictively fetching uh, and writing uh, memory. Uh, we did this using instructions that added to a processing element. Uh, and these instructions spawn uh, uh, tasks that do the fetches 
and do the and do the writes predictively. Uh, and we have a network on chip uh, to communicate results uh, horizontally as needed. Uh, we uh, did reduce this to layout. We have a full layout uh, for the uh, uh, two custom layers. We did this both in 65 nanometer and 28 nanometer. Uh, this is the 65 result. Uh, the, uh, the processor itself is a processing element, a SIMD processing element actually taken from another project. The management layer is mainly FIFOs to help with the first step buffers, to help with uh, the uh, interface to the DRAM uh, and uh, rely on the DRAM for weight storage. So there's, there's no caches in this. Uh, there, there is SRAM, uh, but it's for rate matching, uh, not for temporary storage. Um, and we have uh, TSV banks that connect vertically uh, to the uh, uh, memory layers uh, uh, with the aggressive TSV pitches uh, using the five micron pitch that, that came from enhanced uh, from uh, Tezeron's technology. So again, uh, these we have uh, 64 memories, each with 64 banks, uh, very wide pages, uh, 2,048 gigabits per second up and down per memory. That aggregates to 130 terabits per second of memory, which is a lot of memory bandwidth, actually more than we could actually use. And the way this is organized, uh, the, the weights were communicated uh, vertically. Uh, and that's how you organize the uh, data with respect to the processes. Uh, and uh, the data uh, communicates both vertically and horizontally. And, and these uh, tends to need less bandwidth uh, than, the, uh, than the weight fetching. So uh, Lee Baker in his work uh, did a build a detailed simulation model of uh, using extracted results from the chip designs. Uh, and he actually uh, uh, ran uh, different stages of uh, neural networks. And these are the bandwidths that could be uh, sustained uh, for these individual stages. Put this together uh, in, uh, 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 to uh, replicate the convolutional neural network, running 10 of them in parallel at 60 frames per second. The total power works out to 75 watts, um, more of which is in the processor array than the memory. This works out to 125 millijoules per classification versus uh, 250, 295 millijoules uh, for a, a, a competing uh, uh, processor only that doesn't include the memory uh, called Iris. Uh, so this is very efficient from a uh, power uh, perspective. Um, we also looked at a customized processing element designed very specifically for uh, long short term memory and MLP, uh, the two other algorithms that we looked at. And, uh, and these were able to sustain uh, almost a half a terabyte per second of bandwidth uh, and significantly outperformed a, a GPU alternative uh, uh, for LSTM and also for the uh, deep neural network. Uh, running a um, multi-layer perceptron. Now, uh, we realized that the uh, DIRAM memory um, uh, never came to fruition. Ask Bob for the war stories on that. Uh, so we've also looked at what you can do uh, with uh, 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 more conventional memory technologies. Uh, uh, this is a, a different PhD student, John Bion Park, who uh, produced some very detailed models for 3D DRAMs, what they're capable of. Uh, no, he looked, he modeled both the HBM style, which tends to have large banks, which are relatively slow and have, and thus, uh, and also relatively high power. Uh, and also a, uh, a different uh, DRAM organization, we have uh, smaller banks. This is less energy efficient, uh, but is uh, lower power and has a lot more bandwidth. Uh, and he has a variety of modeled memories. This is just one result. Uh, if you organize uh, this as an array that's eight die high, you can build a 16 uh, gigabit memory in 16 nanometer. This is less dense than uh, a true uh, current commercial memories, but it's very fast. Uh, you can, uh, uh, in burst mode, you can deliver up to 65 terabits per second. And in random access, 11 terabits per second, which is uh, very useful for other applications uh, such as graph processing. Uh, and, and do this at 1.8 picojoules per bit. Um, so this is uh, a, a, a this is not as uh, uh, doesn't have the 130 terabits per second of the DRAM, but it has a lot of memory bandwidth and, and could be built uh, uh, commercially today. 
So this is kind of the overall comparison of the three memories that are possible in this regard. Uh, uh, I put in here an SRAM memory uh, from a published result for a 14 nanometer SRAM uh, that can sustain uh, 0.5 picojoules per bit at a sustained rate of 86 gigabits per second. In contrast, uh, uh, Bob's uh, DIRAM concepts are very power efficient, 0.13 picojoules per bit and potentially and can sustain or compete at 130 terabits per second, uh, have large capacity. And if you're willing to trade capacity in a, in a more conventional DRAM layout, you can uh, get uh, to about 1.8 picojoules per bit uh, and sustain uh, 11 terabits per second of random access and, and 65 terabits per second of uh, burst mode access uh, in a 16 gigabit memory. Or if you add more layers, you can increase it potentially even further. Uh, so, uh, that's the, uh, uh, that's the end of this presentation. Uh, um, the main message here is that uh, IO, uh, uh, AI and ML workloads have bandwidth requirements that, can, that go beyond that to provide by HPM. Um, and the staff had a very good slide on that. And I illustrate here two approaches, one using the Tether on DIRAM, uh, the other one using a, a somewhat more conventional memory architecture that can provision this bandwidth. And uh, the work I presented uh, was not just Lee's work, uh, but but uh, was done with other students presented that are uh, listed here and was uh, funded by these organizations. So uh, thank you very much. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, let's thank Paul. Very good talk. We enjoyed really. Other questions? The audience? We got no questions in the chat. So, the audience, please. Maybe I start with a question. So, um, if you look, for example, on this uh, physical system in, in the slide 11, so it's an amazing stacked system. No? And um, what I'm wondering, um, I think um, you have some, so are there issues for the yield? Or I know that you have a correction um, concerning the, the, the yield losses that you normally would get. Um, can you talk about this? The, the yield or the uh, heat, heat the, issues? Uh, are there yield issues with the system? I, this is a very aggressive uh, system with a lot of three silicon vias in it uh, at, at, at fairly fine pitches. So it's, it's to illustrate the potential of 3D, uh, but with mm -hmm. the fine uh, three silicon vias, uh, the potentially mm -hmm. yield issues. Uh, though, of course, it's a DRAM. Uh, there's a, a number of things you can do to ameliorate yield, uh, spares in the rows and columns, uh, and, and even spare banks here. I mean, you can afford to actually have a a uh, DRAM 4 bank that fails and, and just shift the workload around. So you I think Bob wants to comment on this. Yeah, you can lose count of the DRAM layer. So Bob commented that uh, you could use, lose half of a DRAM layer and then this would still work. Thank you, Bob. Okay, that's interesting. And that's an important point that Bob raised. Um, and when you, when you stack DRAM on uh, logic, what you're always worried about is that the logic will heat the DRAM uh, beyond the point where the leakage current gets too high. And what Bob pointed out is the uh, DRAM, uh, DRAM is designed to run 105 degrees, so it can afford to do that, whereas uh, normally you're limited to about 85 degrees. And that would probably be achievable in this system because it's, the overall power efficiency is very good. Uh, admittedly, as, as Mustafa was pointing out, there could be scaling issues, but given the technologies we use, uh, this is feasible thermally as well. Okay. Are there further questions? Online? Uh, yeah, there, there, there's another one in this room. Oh, yeah. Please. I was just curious, uh, you go, I think on the flat out of this, you had a layout uh, of. Uh, uh, the question is, were these matched to the form factor of the DRAM? And yes, they were. Uh, this uh, this is matched to fit under a one gigabit bank. 
of, of the DRAM uh, to give 64 gigabits total. Uh, and as you can tell, these are these are floor plans. Yeah. Okay. If there are no further questions, let's thank Paul. Thank you very much.